Moxie is the absolute worst thing I've ever seen in my entire life. In fact, it was so bad, I actually died watching it. Ah, dead. Okay, maybe that was a bit of an exaggeration, because even though this movie was bad, so bad it did end up leading to my death, which had to get me to do some kind of rituals in order to resurrect myself, the movie should not have affected me in that way, because honestly, if we're being 100% fair to the movie, the movie was not designed for me. I am not the target audience of this movie, and from looking at my demographics of the people who watch these videos, you are likely not the target audience for this movie. This movie is about high school kids with high school problems that start a revolution against the patriarchy while they're in high school, so clearly and obviously this movie is meant for middle-aged to upper-middle-aged women who have no idea how high school works but think that feminist revolutions start there and that this stuff actually matters because this movie is so disconnected from reality it's absolutely amazing and it's funny to watch it. I actually enjoyed watching this movie in a unironic way or in an ironic way even though I went into this movie trying to watch it in an unironic way. And what do I mean by that? You might say, Sean, why are you interested in high school movies? What made you gravitate toward this film? And honestly, it was the director of this film, Amy Poehler. Amy Poehler, who is known as that lady that's always right next to Tina Fey. And the reason that this association actually had me initially interested in this movie is because Tina Fey actually wrote the script for Mean Girls, the movie, which despite it being in high school, despite that movie targeting a different demographic from me, is actually a good movie. However, while Mean Girls was charming, funny, and clever, and actually had a message that was very introspective for young women in our society that could actually apply to women more broadly across this country, this movie is fantastical in the ridiculous nature of the storyline of this movie. Everything about this movie's high school scenes are completely alien. I will give it credit, the high schoolers do look more like high schoolers than they did back in the early 2000s, but other than that, this is in no way, shape, or form in any way connected to reality at all one little bit. Yes, I'm repeating myself, and that's how you know I'm passionate about stuff. Yes, I'm using different words. Yes, I cracked the thesaurus. Yes, I'm going to leave that taken. I really did stumble like that to repeat myself because this is how much this movie is just completely wrong. And it's really from the outset. So our main character of this movie is this girl. I do not remember this character's name, so I will be calling her Plain Jane Amy Poehler insert character. And we'll call her Plain Jane or Amy Poehler, even though Amy Poehler's actually in the movie, for short, just to get through this, even though it will be confusing later. The main villain of this movie is this guy. Evil, white, racist, rich, possibly quarterback that's not very good, but gets rewarded for his white mediocrity because he's so evil, white, and racist, and everybody is evil, white, and racist. This character makes no sense from the outset. It's not like we haven't had bad guy jocks in movies before, but this guy's combination of factors just don't make any sense at all. I'll give you an example so you can understand this on how this is not a character. This is a list of things that regressives hate about white people or about what they imagine white people are actually like from within the first 10 minutes of the movie. So the movie really gets kicked off by this character who's like bisexual Latin black woman of color that's a strong feminist being upset that the summer reading included the book The Great Gatsby. And the reason she's upset that the summer reading included this classic work of literature is because The Great Gatsby, according to her, is a rich white man writing about a rich white man who's upset that they can't have a woman. And well, I think the real question is, why are we still reading this book? It's written by some rich white guy, about some rich white guy. And I guess we're supposed to feel bad for him? Because he's obsessed with the only girl he can't have. And if we're really going to read stories about the American dream, if we're really going to read important literature, we need to read literature from immigrants, from single mothers, from black, BIPOC, trans women of colors. I mean, if the point is to learn about the American dream, we should be reading about immigrants or the working class or black mothers or at least someone who doesn't already have a mention. Because their stories need to be told. Honestly, it's really, really racist that classic literature written in the English language is written so often by the majority of people historically who spoke and wrote in the English language. That's this girl's position. I understand it. I don't agree with it. But this is something that we commonly hear from regressive leftists all the time. So her character right now makes sense because she's just a young regressive leftist. 
But then the football player chimes in, the captain of the football team, the quarterback, Mr. Jock that's ranking everybody based on their physical appearances, and he jumps in, he interrupts her, he white splains and mansplains to her that The Great Gatsby is actually a classic work of literature, and he starts passionately advocating for this book to be continued to be read in school. The problem is, is that this is a summer reading, and I, who is not the captain of the football team, never read one book I was ever assigned to read over the summer because I didn't care that much about school because I wasn't a nerd. If you do summer reading, you are in fact a nerd. Unless you're a child watching this and your parent thinks it's inappropriate what you're watching on the internet because you get bad advice from it, pretend I didn't say that because I don't mean to give you bad advice. But overall, you're a nerd if you do that. And there's no real high school jock quarterback guy that's going around de defending The Great Gatsby. It's never happened, it's never going to happen. This only exists in the imaginations of regressive feminists, so why is it within the first 10 minutes of the movie? But it actually gets worse than that, because the setup for this scene is that he's angry, presumably because the new girl, who is this black, Latin, BIPOC, bisexual, woman of color, important person, feminist, who doesn't take anything from evil, white, racist, white man, football quarterback, defender of classical literature guy, he's upset because she's sitting in the front seat, which is presumably his seat. Can I help you? I don't know, can you? And it kind of gives you like a weird vibe, like he's like kind of telling her or implying that she should be sitting closer to the back. So you're like evoking old civil rights imagery that's also completely inappropriate for this scene. Also, high school quarterbacks don't tend to sit in the front of the class. People who don't care about school that much tend to sit in the back. But it actually gets worse than that, because if that wasn't subtle enough for you, if it wasn't enough to make you hate this evil white racist white man who's evil right and racist and white and racist and blah blah blah. The following scene with him and this strong bisexual Latinx black woman of color who is defending her honor against the evil white patriarchy is him coming up to her at the vending machine in public taking a soda can that she paid for, opening it up, spitting in it, and then handing it to her. And by the way, she takes the soda can, like she just grabs it out of his hand after he just spit in it. And then she goes to the office to talk about how the white patriarchy football quarterback jock defender of classical literature is harassing her in school and presumably explains the incident that we were just seeing that had witnesses to it. And the principal says, I can't stand up to him because he's mediocre, white supremacist, patriarchy, all embodied into one, and I'm just a poor woman without your strength, young woman. There's no way I can do anything about it. Literally, like, she does not take her complaint seriously, even though these kind of incidents would obviously raise huge alarms in school, especially with a new kid. Now, while this is all going on, plain Jane, Amy Poehler insert character, is looking at it and she's taking it in and she's just formulating her female rage. I actually ended up watching this movie or I knew this movie was gonna be bad after my initial hope based on the whole Amy Poehler, Tina Fey thing because one of the trailers for this movie or one of the things that was promoting this movie said that it was instead of a coming of age story, it's actually a coming of rage story. And I thought that that was one of the cringiest descriptions of a movie ever. So I definitely had to watch it after that. So Amy Poehler's insert character is getting really, really mad. Her feminism is boiling up in the surface. So then the list comes out. And for those of you who are unfamiliar about how the high school kids work, first and foremost, what you need to know is that in movies, when people send text messages, they go out to the entire school. This always happens. It's totally not an overused cliche that never happens in schools. And in this instance, what got sent out to all the people in all the schools was a list ranking all of the girls based on their physical attributes and nothing to do with their brains at all. The sexism is so palpable, and guess who the leader of this is? Guess who is starting up this list? Guess who the chief white patriarchy sexist is? It's the captain of the football team. It's the white supremacist. It's the evil white man, white racist, captain of the football team, patriarchy handling guy who also defends classic literature, this man. Now in response to this, Amy Poehler's insert character creates the magazine or the newspaper clipping or the whatever, whatever called Moxie. I think pamphlet is the right word for it. And in Moxie, she calls for activism. She calls for the women of the schools to step it up and show solidarity with one another by drawing, and I'm not joking about this, 
hearts and stars on their hands to show that they're not down with the patriarchy that's going on in this school. Lady power. And some of the girls do it at the school. Not all of them, not our main character, Amy Poehler's insert character's best friend, but a lot of the girls do it. And the girls that do it are all basically attributes, tokens from intersectional groups that are gonna unite to form our larger group of friends. So we have lesbian black girl, we have Latin soccer player, and the soccer team, by the way, they win every game. This is important later. The football team, they lose every game. So this guy's a jock and he's up for a scholarship, even though football in college is incredibly competitive and they're losing every game. Totally makes sense. Totally sensible. Don't worry about it. Don't think about it. It's rewarding white mediocrity. There's also a transgender person in it. There's also a person in a wheelchair because, you know, ableism and all that. And this diverse group of people are rallying on fighting against the Moxinator or fighting for Moxie against the patriarchy. They're smashing the patriarchy like it says in the trailer. <laughs> That's hot. Oh, and also, this male feminist guy, he's on board. He's the main love interest. They get together at the end. Don't worry about it because they get together because he's a male feminist. And we all know women absolutely love male feminists. But the next thing to happen in this movie, the next cracking down of the patriarchy, is actually something that could be rooted a little bit in reality. And that is the dress code gets enforced against one of the female students who is more endowed in the chest to phrase it in a way that I don't think will get me demonetized. Now, while this does happen, while schools do have dress codes, and sometimes it can be really embarrassing for girls or anybody to have the dress code enforced against them, the way that they present this in this movie is the most unrealistic way humanly possible. First and foremost, we have our principal, our principal who's scared of the high school quarterback because, you know, white supremacist patriarchy, just walking through the halls, and randomly she decides out of the corner of her eye that she sees this one girl wearing a tank top in school and that's inappropriate. So she comes into the room and demands that this girl cover up. She has to put on a sweater or whatever. The girl doesn't have a sweater and she gets sent home. However, while this is all going on, the girl makes this obvious point, which is a snitch point, but it is an obvious point, that the girl next to her is literally wearing the same top. However, she doesn't get in trouble for wearing the same exact top according to the dress code because she doesn't have the same kind of uh, features, if you get what I mean. This automatically puts this scene in the realm of absolute ridiculousness and complete unrealisticness. I had a dress code in my school. You couldn't wear hoodies, you couldn't wear like little windbreaker jackets or anything like that. You had to leave that in the locker and you couldn't wear like scantily clad stuff for women. And I can assure you that the teachers weren't going around, especially the female teachers, weren't going around and looking for women or girls that look more developed than other girls and making judgments based on that. This clearly would lead you to get to a lawsuit. And remember, this girl was suspended even though the principal had that contradiction pointed out to her right in front of her face. And the only difference between these two girls was their body. This is the most obvious sexual harassment case humanly possible. And the idea that this is a thing presented like it's supposed to be real, absolutely ridiculous. And the moral of the story, by the way, is the girl, she, she says she's gonna dress however she wants and everybody else can suck it. Screw your school rules, we're not gonna do it. The girls do like a protest where they all wear tank tops and all that. But that, that's neither here nor there. Seriously? Gosh, that's so convenient for you. You get to just say this is a women's issue so you don't ever actually have to do anything, right? Mm-hmm, that's fair. Uh, I could do more. I, do you understand I'm in a tight spot? You know what you don't understand? This dress code thing may seem like whatever to you. It may seem like whatever to all of you. But I'd say it's another way to control women. And if you're doing nothing, then you're part of the problem. Now, after the drawing stars and hearts on your hand activism and the wearing scantily clad shirts activism, we move on to our primary activism of this movie. And this all revolves around a scholarship that always gets awarded to the white male patriarchy racist people like the quarterback and our main antagonist of this movie. And he's gonna get this scholarship despite the fact that the football team loses every game by like 50 or 60 points. They're not any good at all. Meanwhile, you have the girls soccer team girl. This girl soccer team is so amazing. They've been undefeated for 27 seasons straight and they're just doing amazing and nobody even cares about that. There's no scholarship opportunities for girls at all, and nobody cares about it because it's girls' soccer. Pep rallies were for teams who actually won games, 
It would be nice to have your cheers up in here. Yeah, and maybe the bake sale could buy us new uniforms. It's not like we have a country where Title IX is the law of the land and you literally in colleges have to counterbalance large teams like football teams with female athletes. So females actually have disproportionately more scholarship opportunities and schools actually have failed in filling all their scholarships. So they actually bring on people who have in no way, shape or form even played the sports that they were actually in. No, 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 no. This girl is gonna have a lot of trouble getting a scholarship. Unlike mediocre white man who's trying to get a scholarship to play football in college, which is in no way, shape or form, one of the most competitive and profitable things on planet earth. This guy's just gonna get it because of white mediocrity. That's totally how that works and you need to accept that. We're here to celebrate the end of the mediocre white dude's chokehold on success. But these girls don't accept that and they decide that they're gonna run a campaign to get their soccer girl winning this election and get the scholarship. Even though she's a junior and the football quarterback is a senior and the scholarship is granted by a former football player at the school and it's just for $10,000 that you spend on university, they're deciding that they need to get it because white people are too entitled, man. They just need to stop it and they start running their campaign and they campaign hard. They go after it, they, they go get it, they, they torch it and then they lose. Now the reason why they lose in the film is because the mediocre white guy who's not good at anything, who doesn't deserve anything, and thinks he's entitled to it, actually campaigns in an intelligent way and he makes his case to the entire school. You see, all these girls are publishing their newsletter that are smearing people on the football team anonymously. So this guy comes out up front and gives a speech to the entire school about how basically this is anonymous bullying and nobody would tolerate this in the other direction. He campaigns in this way prior to the vote and it ends up working for him. And I thought honestly that this was gonna lead to a plot of them rigging the election or some such thing, or like somebody in the scholarship thing not wanting it to go to a girl, or something like that. But when I realized that wasn't happening, I actually had hope that the message of the film was going to be, okay, you want to start up your campaign, you want to be activists and all that, but sometimes you don't get everything you want right away and you actually have to work on for it. So even though the movie was ridiculous and some of the discrimination that these people were facing was cartoonish in its depiction, that message would have been good. You have to fight on. You can't expect to win everything absolutely immediately. That's where I thought the movie was going with this, but of course it doesn't. And we're gonna get to what happens to this guy in the end because it's so ridiculous that I have to talk about it. But first, we're gonna talk about what happens in the interims. You see, after they lose the campaign because they were outmaneuvered by the person they've been calling mediocre the whole time, based on the color of his skin and his gender, they get really mad. And our main character, Amy Poehler's insert character, starts lashing out and being really petty to people who never did anything to her. She actually attacks Clark Gregg, a character played by him, AKA Phil Coulson from The Avengers, for having an American flag on his car. And she screams at him at dinner, and this is the guy that her mother is dating, and it's like the first guy that she's dated in years and she's really excited about him, because America is not going to be gender equal for another 230 years, according to her. And when I say according to her, I mean according to that Melinda Gates campaign that has been thoroughly debunked that all these celebrities appeared in a video about. And of course, Melinda Gates, the person who's a multi-billionaire because she's married to Bill Gates, is launching this campaign about how women supposedly won't be equal in the United States of America for another 230 years. Absolutely ridiculous, absolutely rude, and honestly, this was the one scene in the entire movie that got me angry. Because that man is Phil Coulson. That man united the Avengers. He took a scepter in the heart from Loki, and as Guardian God, well actually a frost giant who's masquerading and endowed with the powers of an Asgardian, and this girl is just talking trash to him like she's entitled to do so. Anytime you're confronted with Phil Coulson in any situation whatsoever, what you need to do is show that man respect. Did you assemble the Avengers? Did you save New York? Did you lead to the team forming that ultimately defeated Thanos? I don't think so. You started a newsletter at your school, so shut up and stop being petty. Yeah, I'm sorry, I just needed to get that off my chest. You see, I actually watched all seven seasons of Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D., so I've seen the suffering of post being stabbed by Loki that Phil Coulson has actually gone through. And honestly, I just leave him alone. He's a good man. He's actually not even a man anymore. He literally became a robot in that show because he was killed off and they brought him back against his will as an LMD. Yes, you should watch that show. Yes, that was a spoiler. Yes, I'm giving you the spoiler warning after I spoiled the thing and I'm sorry about that, but you definitely should watch the show and you shouldn't disrespect Phil Coulson. 
Anyway, wrapping up our main tale about this feminist revolution and how I thought at this point when it was clear they weren't going with the evil racist white quarterback man rigged the election that maybe the message was you don't get everything at once, it's a struggle, you gotta push forward. Nope, that, that, that wasn't the message. It turns out that the guy, you know, sexually assaulted another student and then he got expelled because they revealed it and the girl stepped up, told her story and they were like, believe women and, you know, all people who defend classical literature who are quarterbacks, who are mediocre quarterbacks who get scholarships, even though mediocre quarterbacks don't get scholarships, they're not only evil, white, and racist, but they're also sexual assaulters. They're predators. So yeah, he, he gets hauled off to jail. The other girl gets the scholarship, presumably, and everything wraps up because of an anonymous allegation in the Moxie newsletter or whatever. He gets me too I, I guess is what I'm saying. Yeah. So that's the movie. It was pretty cringy. Uh, I guess watch it or don't. I don't honestly care. I was just making this video because I thought you might enjoy me delving deep into the cinema and the cinematic mind of Amy Poehler. And yeah, wasn't that compelling. This is how I'm ending the video. Like, share, comment, blah, blah, blah. Do your thing. Till next time.